Thirty years ago, uh, EMI, Britain's largest record company, took a, a short-sighted decision. They weren't sure that the long-playing record was here to stay, so they held back while others were in on the audio revolution from the start. Now the world is on the verge of the next great audio revolution, the compact disc, which its manufacturers say offers pure, perfect sound forever. And once again, EMI is holding back. This is the compact disc. It really is compact, smaller than an existing single. And this is how it fits into the player, like so. It's played by a laser, and it's been developed by Philips Corporation of Holland, who are now marketing the system with Sony of Japan. Most British companies are going to use the compact disc. EMI won't. So what could they be missing? Ian Smith reports. Britain's record industry is not booming. As youth unemployment mounts, sales are contracting. And as the number of records people can afford to buy goes down, even the former fat cats of the record world are feeling the chill. The British record industry is, is it's tough. Over the last two or three years, it's dropped between 20 and 30 percent overall. Uh, the prime uh, area for um, loss of sales has been the LP. Singles have remained static over the last couple of years, but that's significantly lower than it was four or five years ago. And the pre-recorded cassette market has uh, in cons consistently increased, but it is, it is tough. It was the Arabs who put up the price of records in the mid-70s. Vinyl, which is what records are made from, comes from oil. And as the price went up, so the public became more discerning. They'd got much better hi-fi than when LPs first came out in 1949. And the imperfections of the vinyl disc became more and more apparent. Wow, flutter, static and dust all helped to weaken the LP's appeal. Now, though, the very latest developments have produced a machine that does away with much of that and could kill the LP, consigning it to the same dustbin as the 78. It's the digitally recorded compact disc. The system's not cheap. The player will sell for a little under 500 pounds and each record for about nine pounds. But the disc itself is barely five inches across. It doesn't matter if you finger it, bend it or even scratch it. Its message is under a protective laminate over the surface and its musical code is read at a distance by a laser beam that tracks across its surface. Not a needle in sight. The machine itself is an incredible calculator. It's a computer. For example, the tracks on the disc which uh, the, the laser is tracking, you get a hundred of those in the width of, say, an average human hair. Uh, it operates at incredible speeds. I mean, this computer can take decisions in the sort of time that it takes light to travel just a yard or a couple of yards. And that's the sort of machine it is, really an inf incredible calculator. The laser disc was invented by the Philips Electronic Company of Holland. They've gone into partnership with Sony to produce and market them. Philips say these machines are the biggest revolution in home listening since stereo. Plans are well underway for the same disc to be usable in a Walkman or a car stereo. But just how good is the sound made by the Philips laser disc? Is it that much better than existing hi-fi? Tony Faulkner is an independent sound recording engineer. He works at the most sophisticated end of the market, where quality of sound most counts. His equipment is the most up-to-date and expensive. For example, this digital audio editor alone costs £17,000. So what does a man like Faulkner think of the quality of the Philips compact disc? I think that it's definitely the, uh, the medium for the future. My business is in uh, classics, where the sound quality is of paramount importance, and the improvements to me are, are stunningly obvious. In what way? There's much lower noise, much better clarity of sound, and also the records are much easier to handle. Not everybody wants to be an audiophile expert to enjoy music at home, and these records, which you can thumb and you can throw around with reasonable care, uh, do maintain the quality from uh, when you originally bought them. And if you're a fan of Queen, Pink Floyd, Cliff Richard, Duran Duran, Simon Rattle or Andre Previn, same thing applies. Not available. They all work for EMI. They could be available on compact, 
but EMI are balking at a three cents a disc royalty that Philips would demand. Surprisingly, EMI's reticence is not for want of Sony trying to persuade them to get in on the market. Well, over the last two years, we've, um, we've done various presentations to EMI at various levels. I guess we've done at least six presentations in that time, uh, including one presentation at very high level to their board. And um, the reaction has generally been that the product is exceptionally good. But they did seem to have one reservation, which was really the three cents royalty that uh, is uh, imposed on each disc. I've not actually had a demonstration of it personally. I mean, I've seen it. But those people that have have been very impressed with it. And I don't think there's any criticism of the system. Um, the consumer will tell us whether it's what he wants. Um, we are the manufacturers of programs and we will make our programs available to the public in whatever format they want them, whether they be plastic record, 12 inch records, cassettes, video discs, compact discs, banana leaves, you know, allowing for the quality, as long as that's a sufficient quality, then we will make them available. And the decision with the compact disc is that we will wait and we will observe its introduction and it's uh, the reaction to it over, you know, uh, it's, it, it's early beginnings and see how the public react to it. I think they suffer in the way that many British companies do in that uh, they are forced to be ruled by accountants and lawyers. And uh, as I was saying to one of my friends here by the other day, to run a company purely with accountants and lawyers is a bit like having a football team of goalkeepers. You do need to have a mixture of talents and uh, inclinations in the, in the team. There are those, a few, who argue that EMI are merely keeping their heads when, all about, others are losing theirs. That EMI's reticence about compact disc is only sensible commercial prudence. I think EMI can afford to wait and see on this. I think the consortium producing the compact disc is more in need of the big record companies rather than vice versa. So if you look at the American scene, for example, the four major record companies there, of which EMI, of course, is one, control something like 75% of the market. And it's this product which is essential for the success of the compact disc. Nobody knows what the marketplace is going to be like. I mean, it's a, it's a whole new system. People have got to buy new hardware. They have to buy new software. Um, Philips themselves, I believe, have said that it's going to take sort of eight to 10 years, as, as I understand it, to, to take a real hold in the marketplace. Uh, and I don't believe that we're going to be left behind at all. I mean, we, we can observe the situation and, and, and see how the public react to it. And I, I, I don't believe that uh, it will come in and replace the conventional disc or the cassette tomorrow. Lovely new toy. That report by Ian Smith.